Hey guys, welcome back. It's Chris Bercher. This is Knowledge Plus Experience Equals Wisdom. Still experimenting with the stand-up desk's new studio, which I, I think I like. Uh, we'll see. Maybe I'm a little bit washed out with a gray on gray. Uh, I'll figure it out. If you're listening on podcasts, it doesn't matter. This is uh, episode 132, Growing Smaller. So check it out. I've been thinking about this a lot. And uh, right before COVID, I guess, maybe for the 2019... Um, some beer giant world uh, beer association. I, I don't even remember what it's called when I was back in the beer business before I got out of the beer business. I was selected. I submitted and was selected to give a talk at a national conference. And the title of that talk was Growing Smaller. And it was basically how uh, I was going to tell the story about how I improved profits in my small brewery by actually decreasing production. And I talk about this all the time. I focused on sort of the expense column in the profit and loss sheet rather than the uh, revenues column, right? It's completely, you know, non anti neo liberalism, anti capitalist way of like running a business. But it actually worked and I had evidence. And I think the cool part about it is the Brewers Association, that's what they're called, they were into it. You know, they saw the value of me helping. The thousands of other breweries, many of whom have gone, you know, out of business since then, you know, to help them look at this a different way. And and I really think that I will eventually put this in a book. This is this is the this is the title of one of the efforts that I've you know been developing over the course of the last four or five years. And and I just wanted to sort of take a minute in, in today's episode and you know talk about it. Mostly for personal benefit, but hopefully that some of the topics you will find interesting. I think all of it is exceptionally interesting because, number one, the, the thing I've been most obsessed with lately is the, the, the socialist, uh, egalitarian, anti-capitalist idea that infinite growth is simply not sustainable. And I talk about this a lot, but it's a, it's a, it's a movement that's happening right now. And there's organizations like the Post Carbon Institute, the Post Growth Institute, concepts like degrowth and post growth, what Daniel Smachtenberger calls the meta crisis, what Nate Hagens calls the great simplification. This idea that we've burned through all the easy energy that's allowed all this easy growth. And we've sort of uh, accustomed ourselves or trained ourselves that this is the way. And if you think about all of this, this idea that we have to keep growing, there are so many things wrong with it. Uh, 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 income inequality, for example, uh, for-profit health care in the United States. You know, there are lots of reasons why this direction that capitalism has gone, and maybe because growth is one of the basic assumptions and tenets of the success of capitalism. Maybe you can blame capitalism. I don't care. You know, I'm not here to be anti-capitalist. I'm just sort of saying we need a new goal. We know we measure the success and health of our nations in the terms of the gross uh, domestic product. How much money did we make? And we're finding out that that's not actually a good representation of how well we're doing. It's like, take healthcare, for example. You know, where the United States of, of America is one of the most sort of advanced countries in the world. We, we pay the most for health care, but we receive among the lowest benefits. You know, the, the cost-benefit analysis of the health care in the U.S. is terrible. And so what are we doing wrong? We're doing something wrong, and trying to grow perpetually is one of, if not the thing. And the reason I want to use growth in this subject, because I want to placate some of the people who have an automatic knee-jerk response. If you are a neoliberal capitalist and somebody who believes in this, in you know profit being associated with uh, health of society and that, and that trying to be profitable is going to be a good thing, or if you're someone that understands, rightfully so, that we can't just destroy this system because it will create so much damage in the removing of all these infrastructures and this sort of, how are we going to get food if you remove profit from, from, from the, the, being the incentive to grow it and produce it? We're all going to die, right? We can't just change it dramatically. And, and, and I'm with you there. 
You know, the way everything is set up, like I said, the fundamental tenet of everything that we do is a profit motive. And that in order to get a profit motive, that it means growth. And our very economic system is based on creating money based on interest. I'll, I'll bring, a bank can bring $100 into the economy if someone agrees to pay $105 back. That $5 was created, well, the whole amount of money is created, but, is, but it creates that debt. And, and if we have debt, then we have to grow to pay off that debt. It's so inverted, right? Let's dig a hole and then and only, to, only for the purposes of refilling it, right? It's like the, 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 the our, our, you know, we've just forgotten the purpose of life, <laughs> right? We sort of let the, we're like letting uh, capital, the tail of capitalism wag the dog of, of human, whatever the opposite of suffering is, human comfort or peace. Uh, and so, the, and so that's the, the impetus of this idea is that I want to, I want to, or the title, I want to embrace growth because I think there are forms of growth that are not only just important, but are a critical fundamental element of being a human. So basically, really, two types of growth I see are absolutely essential. And so let's keep talking about growth, but just do it in a way that's smaller. So I guess first, let me talk about the smaller. You know, we burned through the fossil sunlight stores in the planet so quickly. And all the benefits that we've seen in the last 50 to 200 years are because of this. As those things run out, we simply can't sustain the rate of growth and increase and, and, and benefits and iPhones and, you know, having four cars in your driveway. We're going to have to make some, we're going to have to make some trade-offs, right? And, and we just simply can't. And, and like I said in the last podcast episode, it's either going to happen in a bad way and we're going to react to it or we're going to get in ahead of it. And thankfully, I think lots of entities and humans right now like some of the ones I mentioned and others I'm not yet aware of, are getting ahead of it. That's what we're doing. And I hope that what I'm doing is getting a part of that. So smaller in that we're going to have to make do with less uh, and get comfortable with less and learn to love less because we're going to realize that the excess that we've been creating is really not necessary. There are wants and not needs, and they're creating more damage than they are good. So, so smaller in a way that we you know, can live peacefully on the planet together <laughs> before some tragedy happens. So anyway, so the two types of growth that I think are critical, one is I think a fundamental value here is that is, is to be more equanimous, to be more equitable, to be more egalitarian as a species. And, and to, in a way to address the massive inequality and the increasing inequalities that we have. And so one of the things we do, I think we do need to prioritize as far as burning the fossil fuels is helping the rest of the world who doesn't have things like sanitation, sewage control, drinking water, enough to eat, helping them do like all the white countries have, like Europe and the United States, burn some of those fossil fuels in order to improve their infrastructure, to get the basic things. First, to first prioritize that then agree upon what those basic needs are, and then sort of ensure to our best abilities that we make an effort using the precious fossilized sunlight <laughs> that we have uh, to, 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 to raise all boats, to, to use a, a terrible cliche that I don't even know is accurate, but to, to bring everybody, to, and that's going to sort of address all the immediate issues, that I think. You know, what are the most, what are the biggest fires what are the 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 the, the bleeds? <laughs> Where is the planet bleeding the worst that we need to address? And let's prioritize our the use of fossil fuels and resources for growth there because it's a it's fair. It's kind of like reparations, right? We crapped on other countries and other peoples and other cultures. We meaning sort of white Americans and Europeans in order to benefit ourselves. That we sort of owe this to the rest of our DNA, you know, our relatives, our ancestors, our future generations. All right, none, not everybody's going to agree with that, but I think in order to do any of this, we got to get to a point where enough of us do. Uh, and so that's going to be the, the the only growth in the traditional sense of you know uh, burning fossil fuels to produce things like 
cement, you know, or food or whatever in a way that's sustainable. And, the, and people are doing this. They're working with indigenous cultures to meet these basic needs, not in European and Americanized ways, but in ways that those cultures have traditionally. And that instead of, you know, building a desalination plant, you know, we'd build cisterns or, you know, the terrible example, but hopefully you get what I mean. And then the second kind of growth, of course, the one that I think, you know, ought to replace GDP as far as a measure of our humans doing well is something that, you know, you could lump under the umbrella of personal growth. As not only as individuals, like sort of the, the, the path that I'm on and many others on are to sort of like, you know, undo familial traumas and break the cycles of abuse and trauma that exists in the world for humans. You know, once we get our basic needs met, once everybody has their basic needs met, then let's work on sort of the other needs. You know, not just the basic biological mechanistic needs of supporting our human bodies, but things like happiness and peace and calm and, and equanimity. You know, these are things that are integral to being humans at, at, at sort of a today now level in the sense of the species and also in the future. Like, isn't it our duty <laughs> to, to DNA and to evolution and all the natural selection that's happened in the past to sort of improve like isn't our fitness like isn't that the idea and I think to, I think the the thing that we miss about improving our fitness is not about Doritos and online sex you know it's it's about calm and peace and and relationships with nature and connectedness and sort of remembering the elements that I think we're forgetting. You know, the, the Homo sapiens has forgotten a lot of the basic fundamental underlying history of biology. And, and, and that includes all these basic sort of, call, you know, I, I call it getting along and I refer to it in peaceful terms, to terms, but it's not always peaceful and sometimes it's violent. But this natural selection of sorting of living at peace with the planet in a sustainable way, all that sounds, all, all those terms aren't doing this justice. But I think there's a, we, we owe it to our DNA, our species, and our ancestors, and our future generations. It's our fundamental, part of our fundamental ecological purpose, right, is to reproduce so that Biology perpetuates through time. And I think it's also to do it in a way that's meaningful, useful, and prioritizes things like calm and peace and cooperation instead of things like GDP and violence and competition. Again, getting to that point is probably going to be like a big part of this work. Like a big part of growing smaller is laying down all the fundamental assumptions and sort of redefining our global values in a more ecological and a natural sense. Like what does nature value, right? What has worked? What has been weeded out? Why are things here that are here? And why are things in the fossil record that aren't here anymore? You know, what are the basic fundamental sort of measures, non-GDP, not profits, but the similar sort of accolades, if you will, of the evolutionary uh, history that, that, uh, that are valuable? And let's agree on those things. And I, and I think, just throwing these out there, because this is a lot of work and it's going to be a lot of people, uh, and it has to be a discourse and it has to be sort of a consensus, you know, uh, are things like c connectedness and calm and equanimity and equ equality. You know, I use the, those words because there's not one there. Because life is not going to be fair, but it ought to be, the opportunities ought to have equal access. Uh, and then, you know, uh, like how do we punish people that deviate from these things? You know, I believe in using... Things like shame. You know, I think shame probably evolved with a purpose of keeping everyone in line in the sense of, again, these ecological global values and not a profit motive, uh, right? Not shame in the sense that we know it today uh, as being a terrible thing that I would never wish on anybody, but I do think it probably has a, has a purpose, right? It evolved and we understand what it is and we do it for a reason. Um, instead of like locking somebody in jail or treating them as a bad person and giving them like uh, creating their own self shame, you know, but if somebody steps out of line and somebody starts raping 
people and we've agreed that that's a bad thing, then we have to do something about that. How would we do that, right? You know, it really is like... <laughs> it's the, like the, the only the example that I can think of because I learned it in in history in school is the writing of the Constitution when you know the first Europeans came to the New World and you know of course a genocide for all the Native Americans but then got to start a new country right you don't have to do all those bad things to have that in fact if those guys had any sense. They would have had, you know, at least 50% of the Constitution would have been about adaptive management, like I've talked before, like what to do as things change. But of course, we were so um, um, stuck in such a tiny, narrow time frame, the now, you know, and in that sense, living in the now is bad. Uh, we didn't consider that future generations would, you know, would evolve as much as we do. And again, Going, that's because we didn't define the global values. We started, you know, eight steps down the process instead of at the top. We have to go all the way back upstream. And I, and I, nothing angers me more. And of course, I'm also empathetic than somebody that says, You can't do that. I said this last time. Don't tell me you can't do that. Don't tell Homo sapiens you can't do that because we. <laughs> Of course we can do that. We have to do it. Think about it. It's as if we started a new project and didn't consider you know, these three massive things. And then we just sort of said, well, that's too bad. You know, We didn't consider that in order to move this project forward, we actually had to eat our children. Dang, that was a real... We shouldn't have done that. Oh, well, too bad. Oh, guess what? Three generations later, we're all dead. You know, You don't do that. You correct it. Oh, we screwed up. We got to go back to the drawing board. And of course, again, what everybody, no, we can't do that. It'll make too many people uncomfortable. We're going to have to sacrifice. We're going to not have the three Tahoes in the driveway. We're not going to have the heated pool. These are all silly things. And and, and until we can get to a place where we can make those kind of sacrifices, nothing's going to happen. Like I said, this all may be impossible. It may just be ridiculous. And if that's true, then we are in the state of collapse and we are so far down the road that we might as well throw our hands up and just become hedons. I mean, what's the point? But I don't think that's true. I'm going to hold out until the end. And at the very least, having planned all this stuff and thought about it, all of this stuff will be laying around. Think about it. If there is some you know, um, dystopian collapse in the future and it happens and it's probably not a moment but it's 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 basically a moment in geologic time something dramatic happens and think about the walking dead or the last of us or any of your favorite dystopian uh shows movies tv shows whatever there's that moment when you wake up and the world's completely changed and whether there's zombies around or dinosaurs i don't know what it looks like in those moments all of this stuff will be laying around you know, my podcast, The Great Simplification, all, all the work uh, by the Consilience uh, Consortium or whatever with Daniel Schmachtenberg, all these other people that are doing this work, it's all going to be there. Sure, maybe it, nothing was realized before it was too late, but it's never too late. You know, at least the tools are there, right? You, you can pick them up and go, oh, these guys are onto something. Maybe we should try this. Instead of, but you know, and, and again, the, the, the skeletons should be things like, before you do anything, get together in groups and discuss it and think about what your needs are and what your wants are and what your values are. And then work from there, not start building houses or whatever it is. You know, of course, you know, the, the, the first break in the dystopian scenario is probably like any time, like I said at the beginning, grow, burn the fossil fuels, use the resources as you see fit until you get some minimal baseline of getting your basic human needs met. But you got to get together and be honest about what those things. Getting your basic needs met is not one person living in a 47-bedroom, eight-bathroom mansion by themselves while everybody else lives in teepees. Uh, That's not what I'm talking about. It's let's Let's be honest. Let's make the necessary sacrifices, but also have the things and agree that this is, this is the basic set of the Bill of Rights, right? That would be the Bill of Rights. Uh, what does that look like? And, and, you know, if you don't like it, I don't know, tough shit. You're going to you know, you're gonna have to make amends. Or, you know, maybe there are ways to deal 
with that. But I don't think it would ever come to that. We paint these pictures, and this is part of the I can't do it or you can't do that sort of thing. People throw out these scenarios like, oh, that's going to be anarchy or nobody will stand for that. Rugged individualism is so strong that if you take somebody's guns away, that's going to be war. You know, maybe all those things are true, but personally, I'm willing to risk it. I'm willing to risk this path being so wrong that it creates more damage than we already are facing. And I just can't, you're never going to talk me into that. Nobody is ever going to talk me into trying to make a concerted effort. Nobody's ever going to talk me into believing that if we try to make a a concerted effort about improving the future, we're going to create more problems than we already have. That's the beauty. That's the optimism of being where we are and facing this future that is very uncertain in the midst of, you know, arguably more problems and issues to solve than humans have ever faced in the past. Maybe one, either any one of them is not bad. Like I said, low informed mortality and sanitation, all these technological advances are great, but there's a lot of stuff that's not, you know, and I still think in total, we're, we're, we're in a worse spot than we've ever been. And I refuse to believe that people cannot get together using a model and a system very much unlike the traditional methods that we have. We have to start with a new plan. And of course, it's not new plans. There's lots of alternative plans that have been proposed, but I'm just talking not a capitalist, uh, you know, um, uh, it's whatever you call the type of governing system we have now because it's not really democracy. You know, a different way. We have to do things different. We can't keep saying, oh, we have to follow the construct. Because following the construct is what's, you know, creating the problems. Again, we got to go so far upstream that we're sort of literally reinventing the wheel. But there's so much that we've learned. We're not reinventing the wheel. We're making a better wheel. And again, we, so we, we can't use the same path to get to the solutions, we got to start over. Uh, and, and again, I think there's, if we do that, there, I think what we're seeing in the world right now is the emergence of the critical mass of people and organizations that are going to make that happen. And God, I just hope it happens in my lifetime. I, I have excitement and dare I say optimism that it is going to happen before I die. If I live to be, you know, 80, 90 years old, I will see the beginnings and maybe the middle of this new wave before we get to a point uh, that is too, really literally too late. Uh, and, and, I, and again, I don't really know where that is, but I do believe we're headed there, um, much more so than I think people believed in the 80s and 90s and that post-Reagan, post-World War II era of like maximum bliss. That period is gone. There's a lot of people a little older than me, 55 and up, that still think the world is like that. If your parents are telling you to go to college and be a doctor and live a good life, they're still blinded by that brief period of sort of <laughs> massive benefit, again, that we're never going to see again. You know, we, ha- we live in a different world. And uh, if you're younger than me, you know, in your 20s, 30s, and 40s, you know, this is the time that, like I tell my kids, don't follow the old model. It's almost... The, the probability of the old, the American dream of working out is pretty minimal. It's, min- it's smaller than it's ever been. And when I was a kid, they would tell us, like, if we deviated from that path, you had a high probability of screwing up. And I guess it, it ended up pen, pen, penniless and insane living on the street or whatever the fear was. That probability, if you go your own way, is increasing. You know, look at the YouTubers, look at the influencers, look at the freaking video game players that make millions of dollars. I guess that's the same thing. Um, there are different dreams that whose probability of working out is increasing. So that's the beauty of it. And I, and I think the more you can take a growing smaller approach, the more the higher the probability is. And the more you abandon the old way, the higher your probability of success in the future is, right? And again, in the context of any day, there could be nuclear war and none of it matters. 
that's exciting to me, and I, I hope you, you're picking up what I'm laying down, and I appreciate the opportunity to sort of throw that out there and get this ball rolling, um, and I'll continue to work on this and keep you updated. So I'm Chris Bercher. This is Knowledge Plus Experience Equals Wisdom. That, this is episode 132, Growing Smaller. I appreciate your time. Tell all your friends. Take it easy.